We're here, live, answering questions about fantasy basketball. It is mailbag time. It is Michael Bolton time. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd. Unfortunately, I had to fire my interpreter this morning. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks, the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to PricePicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use the code all lowercase LockedOnNBA. For a first deposit match up to $100. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. So double bang, thumb up, ring the bell, subscribe. All of that stuff is a great way of helping the show. The other way you can help the show is by listening to me answer your questions along with the one and only, the only good Canadian, Adam Stock. Welcome, mate. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for my people, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, this, there's only so much. Uh, there's only so much you can overcome. We are here to talk fantasy basketball with three and a half weeks left in the regular season. People are going to have questions, I am sure. So let's take a look at what people uh, think. Kenny just asked the question that we all don't have any idea about: what is going on with Memphis? And his question is: Does Santi play and perform like this next week against good teams? Now that's a real good question because so far the Grizzlies have played some good teams this week, and after. 60 games of being completely mid. Santi Aldamas decided to be an absolute beast the last week. Adam, I guess we'll just use this as a jumping off point. Like, do you trust any Grizzlies players at this point? No, not really. I would definitely say I trust Aldama more than his teammates, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's all relative. You know, if he has a bad week from three, then he's going to look pretty bad because he's got a lot of value tied up in his shooting. If he has a good week, he's going to look pretty good. So it's a roll of the dice, but I mean, at, at this time in the season, everybody is. That is true. It's very hard to find reliability. And yeah, we all tend to have pretty uh, short memories, I guess, because uh, Dharma, like, uh, he was great the last two games. Yeah, but he was bad for 60 of them. So like, it could it could flip back really quickly. Or he could have a prolonged stretch here of 15 games where he's really good. But I just don't know what this team's going to do. Like, What do they do against the Spurs? Because we know what the pattern's been with Jaron Jackson. Does he sit on Friday? Does Desmond Bain sit? Do we get Jordan Goodwin, Scotty Pippen, Yuta Watanabe, Lamar Stevens, Luke Kennard, any of these guys reappear and play? We don't know. The last three games, they've run like six guys, 35 minutes each. There's no way I have any confidence that that holds. It's just a complete guess. But like you said, I think Aldama is probably one of the safer guys at this point. But two weeks ago, Adam, we would have said, yeah, Vince Williams is the safe guy. Just go with him and look look where that's gotten us. Yeah, definitely. And I think just with Memphis and, and honestly, most of the low end guys, uh, next week, you got to check your schedule before adding any of these guys because next week is a tricky schedule. Memphis is Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, I believe. So they have one quality game, but you might not really be able to start them that much. So be careful. Yeah, that's the thing. Like they only have one more game left this week as well, and it's on Friday uh, against the Spurs. So, like, if guys sit out, then you leave them from Wednesday through to next Saturday before you use one of their fringe guys, and that's completely useless. Like, you're not holding Santi Aldama through that. I, I don't think. Well, he probably would play on Friday, but. He's had random knee soreness and elbow soreness. He was questionable for the last game. So just don't be surprised if nonsense goes on. Ahmed says, is Keon Ellis a must-add? And I think the must-add term, I do throw it around sometimes, but basically, yes. I don't really think that... I don't think Kevin Hurd is coming back in the regular season, at least. Um, I don't think Keon Ellis is losing the starting job, but as we're always going to be looking at, especially in a category league, Adam, at this time of the year, well, I, we can sit here and say Keon Ellis is a must-add, but if you have absolutely zero need for steals then he's as, you know, he's as useful as tits on a ball. Like, he's not doing much else, really. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if Steelers is in play, like, you have to add him. Because the schedule the schedule is really good for the rest of the week, too, and next week, too. They're one of two teams that has Monday, Tuesday. And so it's the Kings, and it's the Mavs. The Mavs are PJ, and then a bunch of low-end guys for, in terms of streamers. So, like, Keon's probably going to be one of your better options. Gabe, uh, or Gab Eshe, I'm going to say it's G Gab Eshe. He, uh... He asked the question that I've been asked a few times without Jalen Johnson, who's an out for a week. Is a Kongwu a good stream? Now, the, the problem that I have with this is that, yes, Adam, but if a Kongwu is on a minutes limit, that's your problem. Like, if he's still limited to 20 minutes, it doesn't matter who's in or who's out. 
he's not going to play more than 20 minutes. But if that minutes limit goes away magically, then he's got to probably start at power forward and going to get 30 minutes a night and be an unbelievably good stream. They also have an interesting schedule because I believe they have two quality games next week. And yeah, that's towards the end of the week. So a little bit iffy early on. But look, if we got 26 of a Kong, which is a very clear must roster, we just don't know how long that limit's going to last. And that can be like a, a limitation on that. It looks all well and good. And then if he plays 18 minutes a night, how useful actually is that? Yeah, for sure. I think it's pretty iffy for the rest of the week. I wouldn't be too, too uh, like aggressive with him unless you don't have any other options. But I think next week, because the schedule is going to be a pretty good bet. I mean, Thursday, Saturday, once everyone looks at the schedule, we'll see that's a pretty uh, a useful one. Even if he was playing like 21 or something like that, still kind of limited by then, he'll be pretty good next week. That's true because there are, I think, half the teams in the NBA next season, next season, next week, Adam, that plays zero quality games. So you'll be looking at like, oh, what about this guy? Like you might use that guy zero times. And even getting one game where you can actually use a streamer, there's more use in that than holding up to someone who you think is better that doesn't play those games. A uh, question yeah, here from okay. from Evan, who is apparently a big Andrew Wiggins fan. He says, you said that you would definitely take uh, Trace Jackson Davis over Wiggins. Can you elaborate why? Kerr has a favor of a history of favoring the vets, and Wiggins' upward trajectory is continued. Why not Wiggins? Well, there's a couple of things I'd say there. They don't play the same position, so it doesn't really matter to me that you know, Wiggins versus Jackson Davis. B, I'm not sure that Wiggins has got an upward trajectory. He's been... He was terrible. He was good, and then he went back to being sort of mid. And... I would take Trace Jackson Davis over Wiggins because Trace Jackson Davis has been better than Wiggins over this period of time. He plays a different position. And he's got a way more fantasy-friendly game. How do you view those guys? And then we can extend it out to the other sort of, I guess, fringy Warriors players, Pajemski, um, uh, not so much Kaminga, but like a, even a Chris Paul or Clay Thompson. Where do you sit with all these guys? Yeah, I definitely like TJD over, over Wiggins. I don't even think that's really that close. The only the only situation where I'd stay away from T. TJD is if I felt like free throw percentage was going to be the deciding category. Yep. Um, uh, besides that, but th that's not like, but then Wiggins doesn't really help there either. So uh, I don't really see the argument for uh, Wiggins in terms of the fringier guys. It, it, like, yeah, they have four next week, but, but again, like how many are you actually going to get from them? Pods is kind of interesting just because he's rebounds and assists. And that's kind of a, a rare combination to find, but I don't really like them overall. Clay again, points and threes. If you need it, go nuts. If not, uh, stay away. Chris Paul, uh, been good. Um, okay. That's, but again, matchup dependent. He's the interesting one to me because he played those two games yeah. that are over 20 minutes and you go, okay, well, I know he's Chris Paul, but like 20 minutes probably doesn't cut it. Right. And then last game he had like 14 assists in 25 minutes ago. Okay. That's more likely, but yeah. they won by 30 points. So I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to judge any of that. So I would hold him definitely Chris Paul over Wiggins and I would hold him over clay. I would hold him over Pajemski and I would hold Jackson Davis over all those guys as well, but they are a that. team that is fully healthy at the moment. So they've just got like too many guys and there's not enough stuff for all of them to do at this point. And stuff will clear up if someone gets hurt. But yeah, I, I don't really see, like you said, I, I don't see the argument there for Wiggins being, um, being someone that I would want. Maybe you could argue in a, in a points league, but even then, I'm not sure I would get significantly into that argument. But what I will do is tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports as well. It is just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six individual player stat projections and you watch the winnings roll in. And at the moment, it is demon time on prize picks. Big, long running demon time here. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn 10 bucks into $1,000. And with demons and goblins, that is the most exciting and newest way to play on prize picks. If you've got that little red demon or the little green goblin on there, you get different payouts up to 100 times your money. They also offer the injury insurance. So if one of your players gets hurt in the first half, doesn't return, that doesn't wipe out your entry. It just eliminates that person out of it. And we keep going with the rest of them, which is something that's not offered on other sites. So go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. And use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. That is pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. The code is locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Price picks, pick more, pick less. It is that easy. All right. Timmy T. Hill 
covers Larry Nance, which will get take us into a larger discussion here. He says, what are your, what's your guess on Nance playing all the upcoming games this week? Three games in four nights for the Pelicans, and they are the absolute best team next week in terms of schedule because they, and uh, it's them and the Bucks who play on the low-volume days and nobody else. So I believe all the way through the next three weeks, the Pelicans play on, I think, nearly every single low-volume day, which is just a wild schedule advantage over so many other teams. But Nance has a history of being hurt. He's also, at the moment, got a history of significantly outplaying Jonas Valanciunas. Given the way this team sets up, Adam, I don't know there's any better option to add. And like we said, like if you got... Like he's got three games in four nights, and then I think it's three or four quality games next week. If you get five games out of Nance that you stream in versus literally zero or one out of like a Pajemski, for example, like that's just a no-brainer, even if he sits one of them. Yeah, to me, he's shaping up as like a league winner. Not necessarily in like his per-game numbers are going to be amazing, but he's just like he's arguably the best way to pick up extra games. In terms of actually playing, I think he probably will. I, I, like he sat during the last back-to-back, but that was due to an illness. Mm. So I'm not sure that he's actually that much – of a sit risk at the moment, unless he picks up another injury, which he tends to do. But uh, for now, I'm not too worried. I was correct. They play, so they've got three quality games this week and then three quality games next week. And they have six over from Thursday on to the end of week 22 next week, which is the most quality games out of anybody. The next highest is uh, Boston has four, Atlanta has four, and I believe Milwaukee's gone. Oh, no, Milwaukee's got five, but there are teams with one you know, that play this week, and there are teams who've got zero next week. So that that's a, such a big advantage to have those three quality games that the Pelicans have, and the Bucks have versus Brooklyn, Houston, the Knicks, the Spurs, the Jazz, the Wizards, the Cavs, the Bulls, the Sixers, the Nuggets, Hornets, Clippers... Wolves, Blazers, Suns, Pacers, Pistons, Raptors, Pelicans. Oh, no, Pel- no, Pelicans, sorry. Uh, Raptors are the last one. All those teams don't play on a low-volume day. So any of you little stream guys that you're looking at, you're just going to sit them down and not touch them. So it requires, uh, Adam, uh, we can tell you that they're low-volume days, but you need to look at your individual roster because there might be one of those days that you do sneak someone in and it changes the whole calculus. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For the guys who haven't looked at the schedules yet, next week has four days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, where there's at least 10 games. So you're going to be overloaded probably at least once or twice, if not three times. There's also not a many back-to-back sets, and almost all of them are tied to the busy days. Well, they all are tied to the busy days. So really, your moves are not going to be going towards back-to-back sets next week. They're going to be going towards like guys like Nance or other Pelicans or Bucks or, or Hawks who have a couple of quality games. And then, like, it, this schedule turns like this all through the other the rest of the weeks. And I believe the final week of the year has two 15-game days and I think two zero-game days, which is just like, yeah, good luck with that. That means there's, like, there's four unusable streaming days. And then you're going to have stuff going completely wild during that time. Ahmed goes back to the well and says, is Fontecchio a must-add player? Yeah, like, I think he has to be. Like, I know he's out, but no Asar, no Stewart. There's literally nobody in his way unless you're a massive Stanley Amude fan. We just need him to be healthy. Yeah, for sure. He's going to score on the high teens at least. Hit two, three threes a game if you need that. Definitely go ahead and add him. Schedule's good. Peter says, what are your thoughts on Brook Lopez's downtrend in the playoffs? So we move on from him to someone on the wire like Aldama. And again, this leads me to a good question. There are two big men at the moment, Adam, who are very clearly at any point of the year, if we were talking about this, I would think we would say, you do not have to hold on to Jonas Valanciunas, right? I think we'd very clearly say that in 12-10 leagues. And I think we'd be yeah. getting to the stage where we're going... I'm not sure what we did with Brook Lopez. Like he's becoming very borderline as to whether we hold Jocks dropping his minutes down. The production's nowhere near where it needs to be. But like we just said, they are the two teams who have got the best schedule next week. So even if like we are considering a drop of Valanciunas, and I'm just adding him in here for you know, completeness sake, or Brook Lopez, the fact that you use them at least three games next week versus yeah, a player on 16 other teams who you'll never use, that sort of gives you that hold. And like he's referenced, I should have dropped him for like a Santi Aldama. Yeah, that makes it, yeah, Aldama will probably outproduce him on a per-game basis, but would Aldama be one of your best 10 players on those high-volume days that you would actually use? Like, these are the questions that we can't actually answer for you, but we can provide the questions that you need to ask yourself when you look at your roster. So that's, uh, it, it is a tough sort of concept to get your head around, but like you said, like next week, you the only time you're going to be able to use a fringe Grizzlies player is on the Saturday, and is Aldama useful for you on Monday or Wednesday? And if not, then it's absolutely pointless to getting him into your roster. Yeah, I think if you're going to drop Rolo, the, like the situation needs to be like it's got to be something for four games, and then you just have to uh, get lucky and have the spots open for those four games. Otherwise, it, you just you hold on. Mama Yama says, 
Do you believe in leaving injured players on IR for at least one game after returning from injury to return to gain shape? I'll let you take tackle this one first, Adam. Um, it, it depends who the the, the drop is uh, and, and how many games you're going to lose. For example, in one of my matchups, I was going against a guy who had Herb coming back on Tuesday, and they ended up dropping like three games of uh, Nembhard. And Herb, Herb was okay. Okay, but I was kind of thinking, I was like, was that the right right move? Uh, it, so it, that's hard to answer in general. I mean, in IL Plus leagues, you try to rotate them in, rot- ro- rotate them out. Like the first game's usually going to be pretty rough, but I, I think that's a hard uh, question to answer without knowing all the other variables. I think it, it, I don't think that's a black and white decision usually. I think that's right. Like uh, it's, it's not a, a straight rule. I think if you wanted to straight rule it as a general thing, I would say, I do like to hold them there one game, but it depends. If they're coming back from a one-game absence due to an illness, then no, like he can go straight back in. If he's been out two weeks with a knee sprain, then I'd probably hold him there. If he's back really early after a hamstring issue, you know what? I'd probably just keep them in the IL there because there's a decent chance of very limited minutes or a re-injury happening. And then sometimes if someone comes back and plays and they get re-injured, you have to wait this period of time for the tag to be put back on, then you can't slot them back in and you get in this roster purgatory stage. But... If you want to say general, like sure, but it really just depends on what they're coming back from, what injury they're coming back from. For example, if we wake up tomorrow and they say Julius Randle is back and ready to go from his dislocated shoulder, I'm not sure I'd keep him in the IL because this is a low, not a lower body injury. I'm not sure it's Tom Thibodeau. I'm not sure he's going to be limited at all. I'd probably just stick him straight back in there. But you know, if it was Evan Mobley coming back from an ankle sprain, what if he plays 27 minutes for or 25 minutes for two or three games? I might hold him back there, considering there is your re ankle sprains happen relatively often, and then and then you're in, in that problem of, if, especially in a games cap scenario or a waiver cap scenario, that you've wasted moves for a, for a half game of production. Yep. Um, all right, Charlie says I've heard you talk a bit about using games cap instead of streaming ad caps. This is an option that exists on currently on fantasy apps. Yeah, it is. You just obviously have only ever played on Yahoo because that's the only site that doesn't allow it. You can do games cap on ESPN, admittedly with some flaws to their system. Fantrax is where I do it for all 91 of my leagues that I'm running that has that format going. Uh, actually, Yahoo does have it, but only if you play Roto. They just don't think to extend that to other formats because they go, why would we do that? Why would we only just uh, keep our product stuck in 1992? But every other format will have this games cap option available. It's just on Yahoo that they don't. Do you play in any uh, head-to-head games cap situations, Adam? Uh, no, I don't. I'm pretty vanilla when it comes to uh, fantasy. I used to be a little spicier, but uh, these days I just play basic eight or nine cap. So I've I've set all my leagues up that this year with with the games cap just because I think it, it introduces a level of I, I I guess I was getting frustrated with a injuries and random rest, but also the fact that so much of it like you look at how much we've dominated this discussion with like. Which, not which player is better or how you built a team. It's like who plays on what day is is the best scenario. And like if you can just get as many guys in to just beat your opponent by 10 extra games that you win. I was like, ah, I'm not sure that that's like the best way to go. And we somehow have always defaulted to this idea that if in order to limit things, we limit how many players we add, not how many games that they play. And then you run into scenarios if you're l- limiting how many games that you add and then you get two guys get hurt on Wednesday and you've got one ad left, well then you're done. Like you've got no way of sort of recovering from that. So that's, that's why I sort of made the flip. I'm going to ask everyone who was a part of that league what they thought of it. I think it's worked pretty well in terms of just, it's hard to get your head around because like you said, like you've done something a certain way for a certain period of time, but it, uh, I think it's worked pretty well in terms of changing some of those frustrations, I guess, around fantasy. Yeah, I think as long as you talk to your league, get everyone on board because I don't think everyone has really probably put too much thought into the rules of their league. I think most people are more casual fantasy players, but that definitely a good true. idea. Lo- lots of pros, like not too many cons really. I guess it nurse streaming a little bit, but I, I guess, but that depends. Do you like streaming? Like not everybody likes That's... that side of it, especially as, as guys get older, they have less time for fantasy. I find more guys start griping about streaming. Yeah, that is. And people say, like, okay, this is yeah, ridiculous. I've got to sit there and add, two guys every day to be able to compete. And I go, yeah, you know what? That is, that is a weird thing that we just accepted to be the the strategy that, that it is. And like, we all just go, well, you've got to stream to win. You do, because that's how the game has been set up. But do you have to? Like, maybe maybe you don't have to. Maybe we can do things a different way. And that's what we just tried to do. All right. Chenk Osman says, what are your thoughts on Mo Wagner? Week 22, week 23, 14 team. Mo has very clearly got the backup job over Gogo Badadze at the moment. He can be a highly efficient scorer. 
But yeah, even a 14 teamer, the Magic, they do only play six games over those two weeks. I think that's the week she said, was it 22, 23? Yeah, they only play six games over yeah, that week. Yeah. They have four of those as being quality games, which is sort of in the middle. There are some teams like Charlotte who have two. There are some like Chicago who have three. I wouldn't say that he'd be a super high priority for me though, unless I'm missing something completely there. Yeah, and I'm just looking at the schedule now. It looks like Orlando's got a break at the beginning of next week, Monday, Tuesday. So probably not the best short-term guy. After that, though, it's okay if you need field goal percentage points and reads. Yep, you know we know we know what he does. But the problem is, is there's a downside of like 12 minutes, which you get some games where they go John Isaac at center as well, which then limits that overall upside. Today's episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home your winning fantasy championship trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, and LED headlights, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. And with all the parts that you need at all the prices that you want, it is easier to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit is only available to US customers. All right. Joseph Kim asked a question. This is the definition of chasing the value, but that is why you're here to ask us the questions, Joseph. What do you think about Isaiah Jackson? Because we saw Isaiah Jackson play 28 minutes in the Pacers last game. Uh, Adam, he put up numbers all over the shop as he does basically every time he gets on the court. But, but, the reason that Rick Carlisle said that he played over Jalen Smith was, ah, he's back in his hometown. Let's give him a crack at it. So what are my thoughts? My thoughts are maybe if they go back to play in Detroit again, that you could go and stream him. But I don't think this is any indication that A, he's playing more minutes than Miles Turner, or B, he's even playing over Jalen Smith as we move forward. He might be, but we all could also could go into that thing that happened last season where it was Smith one game, Jackson the other, and all over the shop, giving you absolutely no ability to figure out who's playing on edge night, meaning they were useless for fantasy. Yeah, I think like Roto may be good add to your bench to see where it goes, but in head to head, you need something uh, more sure thing. I mean, you can't look at Isaiah Jackson's game log and be like, "This is a guy I'm going to trust with my season on the line." Could play zero minutes next game. I would say zero minutes is way more likely than what we got from him in the uh, in the last one. All right, Shaq two K sharp. That's Dayron, Larry Nance, or Rashawn Holmes for big man stats the rest of the week. Who is the priority at? So you're talking the rest of the week. We already know that Nance has got more games than any of those guys. So. You already get that one game advantage there. Sharp, I think he's the best per minute guy there. That's going to depend on Claxton's availability. If you want, I guess, a certain, saying certainty and Larry Nance is a really tough sentence to get out, but he's got the he's got the backbone there of more games. And we sort of know what his role is, whereas Sharp might play 12, 15 minutes. He might play 30. And Holmes is like getting 25 or 26 and they're sort of mid games. How do you view that? I probably do lean just a little bit. Unless we hear that Claxon's out for the week, I would lean towards Nance and the extra game. Yeah, I think I would take Nance either way. Just Sharp would have to probably go off twice to help play Nance. And Nance has been pretty good when the games have been close. Like, there's been some low-minute yeah. games, but they've been when the games have been blowouts. Recently, when it's been tight, he's been in the 26-27 range. And, like, Nance is pretty nice with that much run, at least. The problem with the Pelicans is they've had so many blowouts. And this and this happened, I think, last year as well. It's like, oh, we'll just wait. When, when the game's not blowout, Nance will play the fourth quarter. It's like every game was 25 points either way. And it happens so often. But you're right. Like when they need someone to actually help them win, he's the one who helps them win. This guy's put up some good numbers lately. Peyton Pritchard, Ricardo says. What is Pritchard like the rest of the season compared to Gary Trent? Now, it's all about context here again. We can just do a cursory look at the box score and say Peyton Pritchard's put up some really good numbers. And in two of those games, Drew Holiday was out. One of those games, Derek White was out. And in other ones, there was no Jalen Brown. There was no Jason Tatum. There was no Paul Zingas. And if you go back, just look to the end of last week and you can look at what Pritchard did and you would be you wouldn't be having any discussion about Peyton Pritchard and his production as we move forward. I think this has been a really great period for, it would have potentially been Sam Hauser and Peyton Pritchard because of the three back-to-backs in 14 days that the Celtics had. But that's not going to be the case every week moving forward. So he probably goes back and plays 20 minutes, whereas Gary Trent's basically leading the offense playing 32 a night. So while Pritchard's had a couple of good games, there are very specific reasons behind it, Adam. 
Yeah, Pritchard's good for the rest of the week because of the back-to-back, but then their next one doesn't come till like, the final Thursday, Friday of this, the season, I, I believe. Yeah. So you're going to get all those games. There'll be some rest days mixed in, but you're probably not going to have, like, three of the top six out in too many of those games. So Pritchard is is uh, just uh, for the next few days, and then that's it. Trent could get some sits. I mean, the Raptors are a mess right now, but uh, I'd rather just see where that goes. I saw a question, but I can't find it again. Someone asking about for steals and rebounds, do you want Alvarado or Najee Marshall? I'll just take Alvarado. Like, you, you've got five steal upside yeah, with easy. him. Like, in three games, he legitimately could get 12 steals. Marshall could be solid, but, like, that upside in steals for Alvarado, if that's what you're looking for as well, I can't really do better than that. NGP, who's a better at ESPN Points League? Scoot or Delano? Banton seems more consistent, which is just amazing, but I get it. But Scoot looks like he has a high, higher ceiling. I, I Again, in this one here, Banton has been very tough for me to figure out because A, I don't think he's very good. And then his minutes go 40, 20, 30, 40. Like it's all over the shop. It depends on a lot of guys being out. But if you want to look at organizational priorities, it's got to be like, let's see what Scoot's doing here. And I thought yesterday was a, was a big step forward. So I'm just going to lean that direction because if there's someone who's going to le- lose minutes, not injury related, and they have to make a choice. I'm sure they're going to say, we'll, we'll actually drop Banton back here, not Scoot. I, I, I would guess that's what they're going to do. That That's how I view it. Yeah, I, I think I disagree. I, I think I'll go with Banton just because I, I like his game more for category leagues at the moment than Scoot. Scoot, the problem with Scoot is like, you can get those nights where his shot's off and yeah. then it's just like, the then it's just, it, it's not like a wait, even just a waste of a game. It'd be nice if it was a waste of a game. It's like he's actively hurting you. I, so I, I would go with Banton just can contribute in, in more categories. But but again, it, it, it depends on the matchup. If you're behind and you need upside and points and assists, Scoot is completely fine. It, it is. Look, I, I could go back and forward on this because obviously Banton has outplayed him really like over this yeah. last couple of weeks. But I just, I, I just have this idea that something is going to flip but it could it maybe it doesn't but i've been thinking that for months and then every five minutes there's an injury or something that happens to scoot and it, it sets him back significantly um all right which guy would you drop uh which guy would you drop 14 team league Keldon, johnson clay alice trey man i think you got to drop trey man like that schedule is horrific for charlotte they just don't play on any low volume days really at all i think they've got one low volume day in the next 10 nights which is a horrific schedule. Um, and then it's Keldon, Keldon Johnson, Clay Thompson, and I assume, assume that's Keon Ellis. Yep. Who, I, mm, ah, Ford, mm, okay. So you're obviously in a, a pretty strong team because while I don't love them all as 12-team must, I think in 14 they probably are. I guess, Adam, the easy answer is like, what's your matchup? Where are the categories? Because obviously Ellis is getting you steals, Clay's getting you threes, and Keldon's getting you points and nothing else. But they're, they're pretty different. Yeah, I I, 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 th- I think it's man probably unless you really didn't need steals and then it would probably be Alice. Yep. But yeah, in 14, those all look like solid 14 guys to me. Can't really go wrong. So yeah, just uh, uh, put, put your matchup into whatever you put your matchup into and then the answer will probably be pretty obvious. Concase O. So I've just put this question up now. I've just realized that I don't know who you're actually talking about, but I'm going to make a guess here. So Trey Man or Sharp for Dynasty, do you mean Shaden or do you mean Dayron? If you mean Shaden, it's very clearly Shaden to me. If you mean Dayron, that becomes more of an interesting question. Trey Man has obviously moved into people's consciousness over the last two months or so after being completely invisible for three years in Oklahoma City. I maintain that I don't think Trey Mann is a very good player, but he had a good opportunity here, and that's what we were looking for in fantasy. But I don't think we should get carried away that they go, well, but now we've found our future star guy to pair next to Lamelo. Trey Mann's the answer. I don't view him that way. How do you vote, view Trey Mann versus, let's say it's a Dayron Sharp here, who I do think he's got, he's got unbelievable advanced numbers this season, Dayron Sharp, and I think he could be a, we've talked about Rashawn Holmes quite a bit, like he could be a Rashawn Holmes level starting center uh, for four or five seasons, I, I think so. To me, I'd probably lean towards Sharp, but curious if you have a different perspective on that. Yeah, no, I think it's Sharp by quite a bit, actually, especially with Claxton being a UFA this summer. I think you have to add hold and then see where that goes because if he is starting next year, he's going to be like a, a top, could be the top 100 guy, could be like a uh, mid-round guy. In he's, any, he's Daniel Gafford, team, really. If he, if he starts, yeah, he's Daniel Gafford. Yeah, team punching a... Yeah, like you're punting free throw, you're punting threes, whatever you're doing. I think Charlotte would, with man, they're just kind of kicking the tires, seeing if he can be like maybe a backup guard. I, I bet they don't see him as a long term starter, especially since they're going to be picking you near know, the top of the lottery for probably at least a couple more years. Yeah, like who knows what pick that do they end up? Do they get Reed Shepard? Do they get Dillingham? Do they get 
um, Ron Holland to play on the wing there. Like, where does Trey Man fit with a healthy Lamelo? Like, uh, it's yeah, I, I don't. Nothing that he's done, especially considering they're not even putting him in like a high usage role or anything. They're just sort of going go out there and sort of do some little things. It doesn't give me great, um, great confidence. All right, Claude Santos. This this is the last question we're going to answer, but I think there's some interesting things behind it. it says, do you pick up Chris Murray? He's starting tomorrow, or Grady Dick with quickly out? Now, I think the part of this here is is that we all saw Chris Murray have 17 points last game and have one of the best lines on the Blazers for fantasy. So people go, oh, Chris Murray? I think he had 15 points in the first half and two in the second half. He's also been starting for about two and a half months and he's been nowhere near any of this. So that, that's one good game. I'm not saying that Dick has been good, but the fact that Murray you know, it now comes into our consciousness because of one game, we've got to be really cautious. And this answer this question, I, I think either one, like uh, look at your future schedule, neither of them excite me too much, but it's more about don't get too overly excited when you see one random game and we've got 20 game samples of it being absolutely nowhere near that. Like you've got to be really cautious, especially when nothing really significant changed for the Blazers yesterday. He just had a red hot like first 15 minutes of the game and then it went back to being the old Chris Murray of doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, I think the key is what you're saying is that nothing really changed. Like if he was stepping into a much bigger role, then we could maybe get ex- excited. But it was more just so just like hot shooting. Like he still hasn't been a very good per minute guy all year. I think steals his permanent steal is pretty good, but everything else is is pretty mediocre. That being said, uh, Grady's he, he's all three. He's all his values tied to shooting, and he's cold right now. So yep, he not look like a great option to me. Yeah, so I, I don't think either of them are, are super exciting. But it's more like just that's just a general overarching philosophy of like just be like a lot of us don't have the same time to, to put into fancy that you do or i do adam and we look into all this stuff so they just see a guy pop up and go hey chris murray 17 points i guess we're going in here but it's all about and sometimes something does click or you go they go on a four or five game hot streak and then it all comes together but as a general rule like if you're adding that it's not guaranteed to happen we've seen it happen time and time again where it's just nowhere near that level of production and when we're trying to preserve our ads in the playoffs and get the guys in on the right days to get these mediocre players is not i'm sure you can find someone better than, than both of those guys um uh, i would say mitch williams says Emmanuel quickly is only out one game because of rj's brother's funeral they're really close friends um isn't i think quickly is out again tomorrow this is a lot i said that was the last question but this is the last one i think quickly is out again for friday and that is my understanding that he's out because of rj's brother's funeral but he's missed one game and i'm pretty sure he's out the next one and then maybe he's back across the weekend is my understanding on that adam how do you view it yeah that's a, that's my understanding as, as well i i I, th- I think they already announced he was doubtful or something like that yeah, or, or for the next version i think he's yeah. out i think they've already answered he's out maybe i'm imagining it. it's it's really early here yeah. so maybe i, I just thought it's something like that too let yeah. me just quickly check this where is the news on Emmanuel quickly? Yep, he has already been ruled out for... He missed Wednesday. He's already been ruled out for yeah, Friday. Right. And we just don't know when he's coming back after that. So, yeah, I, I initially I'd ruled him out for about three or four games. Then I pulled it back to two. We're currently sitting at two. So we'll see where we go from yeah. there. But where we're going from here now, Adam, is to end the show. So thank you for being a part of it and tell everyone what, you're, what you've got cracking here over the final three and a half weeks of the NBA's regular season. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on this year. It's been a lot of fun. I think this is our last Thursday of the year. I really appreciate it. Uh, In terms of what's happened, basically what we're doing today, I mean, that's what's going on with Fan and Fantasy right now. We're we're really diving into the schedule. We're trying to identify the guys who can, maybe not the obvious guys, and maybe not the best guys, but the guys with the best schedules who can who can really help you. So that's the focus for the rest of it. And then we'll do some season wrap up at the end, and then a little break. Then we'll start talking draft, and then we'll get all the way back into it. We absolutely will. Adam, go check him out over on Twitter. Go check out Elite Fantasy Basketball. And thank you again for being a part of all these mailbags uh, all throughout the season, Adam. Appreciate it, Josh. Thanks. All right, guys, you know what to do now. You go, hey, you follow Adam, but you follow me. And you go and give this show a big old thumb. You ring the bell. You leave your comments. You give the five-star review. And, of course, you double bang it. I'll be back later on in the day with a couple more shows. So come and check those out. But in the meantime, guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. So yeah.